So my name is Ira Amelhusen, marketing uh, for LinkedIn, um, and I'm really excited to see a pack house today. Uh, as you know, this is our second Education Connect, and we've really up-leveled the event from last year with this beautiful venue. Uh, also, we've up-leveled the content. You know, we've heard from Alan Blue and Zoe Baird talk about visionary strategies, uh, Stephen and George giving us uh, a more broad view of digital trends, talking about the student journey, um, which is a great setup, because now we're going to give you some more insights into the student journey, so you really can understand the mindset of the prospective student as they're going to get their degree. Uh, a little background on myself, I actually did marketing. I was, I was in your, in your shoes, I did marketing for the Pepperdine University so. MBA school, so I understand your challenges. Uh, it's, it's definitely become more challenging in the past few years to convert prospects to students. I think we can all relate to this first stat this is from Inside Higher Ed and their recent survey on admissions directors, and nearly 60% of them did not meet their 2015 enrollment goals. I think we can all relate to that. This is actually marks the third year in a row that it, uh, the majority of admissions directors did not meet their goals. And this, we all know the reason for that. It's increased competition from online providers. It's uh, a, a focus on ROI and measurement, questions on ROI of the degree, and student debt. You know, there's a lot of headwinds there, but yet the value of the degree is still there. 63% of American jobs will require some sort of education beyond high school in the next three years. So how do we as marketers connect these prospective students to the opportunities that our schools provide with the degree? So we conducted this research to answer this main question. How can higher education marketers impact the decision process of today's prospect who's really empowered with instant access to information, social networks that are giving them reviews, um, and, and this decision process that's changed so much in the past few years. So I'll be introducing Christina Jenkins from our Insights team to take us through some of the methodology. And uh, after that, we'll have two practitioners, Krista and um, Andrew, to talk about some marketing implications. So I'll go ahead and hand it off to Christina. And the goal of this research was really to understand today's prospective student and what is the process that they go through in selecting a university or higher education course that best suits their needs. In addition to understanding the decision journey, we also wanted to understand some of the answers to these key questions. Who and what are the key influencers? And what is the mindset and the motivation behind deciding to go back to school and seeking a higher education degree? Lastly, we wanted to look at the role of content and how does that influence the decision journey. And to do this, we conducted a global survey of more than 15,000 LinkedIn members across 14 countries to really understand what they told us about their journey. We looked at two key groups. The first were those on the LinkedIn platform who were current MBA or masters, so we'll call those the MBA masters grads. And the second were the MBA or masters intenders. And those were people on LinkedIn who have a bachelor's degree, but they told us they're planning to seek further education in the future. For today's presentation, I'm going to focus on the US findings from 1,600 prospective students. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what does this mean for marketers. The first key finding is really that the decision process is an exclusive one, and making the shortlist is critical. The average shortlist from prospects that we surveyed, the number that makes the shortlist, the number of schools, is three. Steven stole my thunder a little bit in the previous uh, session when he also referenced some research that says three. But that just shows that it's a very exclusive process, and being able to make that list is critical. Because we also learned that prospects don't reach out to a school representative until after they've made this list. The second thing we learned about the decision-making journey is that it's incredibly social. And peer groups, families and friends, as well as professional networks, are key influencers. This makes sense if you think about friends and family. When you're making a key decision in your life, you tend to ask them. You want to you get that information and that advice from your trusted advisors. But it also speaks to the need of connections. And Allison and Penry talked a little bit about this in their session this morning around the relevancy, and that's where I think we, 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 were, we were incredibly excited to see that prospects also show that professional networks are three times as likely to be influential versus social networks. 
The third insight was around the mindset and the motivation. And we saw some interesting differences here, primarily driven by age. So millennials told us that they're more interested in going back to school to increase their salary, whereas Gen Xers were more interested in going back to school for personal development, for skills. The last learning was around content. And we saw that there is an important aspect of content during all the phases of the decision journey, but the types of content actually varies. And I'll come on and share a couple of examples of this in a second. So let's dive into the decision journey. We mentioned this importance and the critical nature of making the short list, because our prospects told us that they're only looking at three schools. And by the way, 93% of our respondents told us that they end up enrolling in those schools. So if you're not on the short list, you're going to have an incredibly difficult time as a marketer changing their minds at that point. It also speaks to the need that you need to be influencing your prospects early in the decision-making process, building that awareness, building that early touch point, that relationship that Stephen talked about as well. Because we learned that 72% of prospects only reach out to a school representative after they've put you on that short list. So if you're waiting for them to reach out to you and have that point of contact, it's too late at that point. You're probably already going to be congratulating yourself because they're going to be likely to enroll, but if you're not on that short list, you're going to have difficulty in reaching them. The second thing we learned about the decision process is that it's a very social one. And not surprising that friends and peers are key influencers in the final decision. Second to institution websites, that was the number one influence, but we also saw that professional networks were the same influence as information sessions. And for intenders, we saw that professional networks are three times as influential as personal networks. And this really speaks to the mindset of people when they're on professional networks like LinkedIn. Previous research has shown that people, when they're on professional networks, they're really investing their time. They're looking to make themselves better. They're looking to reach higher goals and aspirations. Whereas when they're on personal networking sites, like Facebook or Twitter, they're spending time, they're passing time. And I think this really came out in this research as well. The importance of relevancy and really understanding how can you help make your prospects better, help them achieve their goals, and use that to make your content marketing really resonate. So let's jump into the mindset of the prospect. What is driving their decision to undertake higher education? When we asked that question, it was no surprise. We saw seeking a higher salary jump up to the top. I think that's pretty obvious to everyone in the room. But when you go beyond salary, you start to see some of the more intangible reasons for them to go back to school. For instance, the need to upskill to be successful in today's world, the passion for learning, increased confidence in my job. And these are important things to keep in mind as you're developing your content, that you're hitting all of these drivers, not just the salary. But what was really interesting was as we cut the data by age, we saw a subtle difference between millennials and Gen Xers in what, what's driving their decision to go back to school. We, there's a lot of research that's been done a lot around millennials, and I think the prevailing thought is that when it comes to your career decision as a millennial, um, you're more motivated by social impact and not by salary. But what we saw in our research was that when you're making your decision to go back to school, to get your MBA, all the influence of the, the recession, the economy, student debt comes to the forefront, and seeking a higher salary is a very important factor. However, with Gen Xers, it's a little different. They're a little further along in their life stage. They're a little more, um, they've solved a lot of their needs for the, the basic salary requirements, and a passion for learning is the number one driver. So I think that's a subtle, a difference in the content that you're developing and you're targeting these types of audiences, I encourage you to, to A-B test that with these different types of audiences. And then I found it interesting that as, even with all this talk about finances, student debt, we really, we still saw that the quality of the learning experience is still more important than cost. So when we, saw, when we asked them, when you're deciding where to study, what is most important? Faculty, teacher quality, program format, and university reputation all ranked higher than tuition fees. So what's, what's interesting there is people are still willing to pay a premium for that quality learning experience. So with all the talk about millennials moving back home with their parents after college, they're still willing to, to pay that premium to get that program information. And I've also found it interesting that university ranking came in seventh. 
So I think that's very encouraging for colleges that may not be ranking as high. It's not as important to them when they're making that decision of where to go. You really need to be speaking to these higher level needs when they're making their decision. And we'll actually talk a little bit later about how university ranking can come into your content strategy as well. We also saw that flexible study options are essential for today's prospect. So part-time local was the number one, and online number two. But we saw some interesting differences between the, the age groups again. So Gen Xers are 58% more likely to want online study options, and millennials are 21% more likely to want part-time local study options. So I think this speaks to the fact that Gen Xers are once again further along in their life stage. They, have a, a, you know, they may have a family, a more demanding job. They really need that flexibility that an online program provides, whereas the millennials are willing, they're not willing to trade that experience once again. They want that face-to-face -face experience. They want to get their money's worth. It's a little counterintuitive because you think millennials as digital natives would be more comfortable with that online format. But as we see here, that's not the case. The last key learning of this research was around the role of content. And we found that content is important throughout the decision journey, but the types of content varies by where the prospect is on that decision journey. So if you look at the awareness phase, here's where institution rankings comes in and plays a really big part, as Ira mentioned. Um, it's, it's also, it's important to get your brand out there and talk about education industry news, career advice. These are the types of things that prospects are looking for when they're just building awareness they're just getting an understanding of where they want to go back to school and thinking about that. As they move into sort of a more proactive stage, the discovery phase, they're looking at different school, different staff lectures and profiles, really trying to understand what's the culture like there? What, what kind of value are the, are the university staff lectures going to bring to me as a student? And then finally, as they get closer to that selection process, making the decision, they're interested in expert commentary. They're interested in reviews. They're also interested in how have your alumni performed? What are the different profiles? What are the different experiences that they've had as a result of their experience at your institution? And you'll notice it's interesting here too, information on the, on the courses and the degree programs, that's table stakes. Our research showed that people want this throughout that process. They really want to understand what you have to offer and what you have to bring to the table and what is that value you're providing to the student. A couple of examples that we found on this uh, on LinkedIn. So if you look here under the awareness phase, here was an example of Harvard Business School. And they're talking really about career advice, almost industry news around how to be, how to be more prepared for a complex change in your life. The discovery phase, the more proactive phase, this was a great example of, of a Syracuse providing more insight into the different ways of, of applying and thinking about being more proactive and almost a call to action there as they get closer into the discovery phase. Click here for more information. And then finally, the selection phase. This was a great example of meet the Chicago MBA class, using, to, using your alumni to really highlight what the value is that your program brings. So to quickly summarize again the key findings of this research, the decision-making process is an exclusive one, and making that short list is critical. But it also is a challenge for education marketers because not only do you have to influence the prospect, you also have to think about influencing those trusted advisors, that sphere of influence. And here's where peer groups are important, but also professional networks and the relevancy that that content can bring can help you do that. Consider the mindset and the motivations as you're thinking about the types of content that people want. And think about those best practices, delivering the relevant content at the right time, which will have the most influence on the prospective students. So what are the big takeaways for marketers? We'll get into some specific examples with our panel in just a minute. But if you were to take away one thing from this presentation, it's this, it's that Marketers need to be influencing these prospects early in the decision process in order to make that short list. And the best way to do that is with always-on content marketing. And to have a successful content marketing strategy, the two, the two keys are context and relevance. So when you're thinking about context, it's important to remember that peer groups and professional networks are a very influential audience. So how do you tap into those trusted advisors? Whether it's arming your alumni and professional groups with content that they can share, program information, 
or building a presence on professional networks and professional groups so that they see you as they're making these decisions. And then when you think about relevance, make sure that you're targeting your content to the different groups in your audience. For example, the differences in mindset between Gen X and Millennials. Make sure that you're A-B testing and finding what works because everyone's different, every program's different. But make sure you're tailoring that content to that audience. And then finally, tailoring content by stage. It's a long decision journey, as we all know, a year and a half to two years. So you need to be there every step of the way with content that's relevant with them. And what you'll see in the end is a higher quality lead because of that relationship that you've built with them. So with that, I'd like to bring up our panel. Krista and Andrew, come up to the stage. So excited to have a panel of practitioners that are on the ground and know the impact of this research and, and how it, the implications it has on your day to day. So I'd love to start off with just introductions. If uh, we'll start with you, Andrew, if you could just give us your introduction of what you do what programs you're marketing, mm -hmm. and we'll throw in a little icebreaker. We'll, if you could uh, fire up the DeLorean, go back in time, meet your freshman self in college, what would be the piece of advice you'd give them? I'll start with that one. Um, <laughs> I would probably tell myself, uh, that, that, would put, that would be probably the early 2000s, I would probably say buy Apple stock. Ah, <laughs> smart. Yeah, and then I probably the, wouldn't the, be here. That's the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see that being Back to the Future 4 with the whole Biff <laughs> analogy. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Andrew Hickey. I'm the director of digital marketing at eCornell, um, which is the online arm of Cornell University. We do online education. Um, we primarily do professional development for individuals and um, uh, learning solutions for organizations. We have um, certificate programs in a number of verticals, marketing, uh, human resources, hospitality. Um, leadership and uh, healthcare. Great. Krista? Hi. Um, which one first? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever you feel comfortable. Let's, let's go with the, uh, the advice first. I, I should have thought of the Apple <laughs> stock. Um, I've, I was just thinking I would tell myself travel as much as possible and uh, the world is your classroom. So. Nice. Um, I'm Krista Watson, um, Director of Paid Search and Social at Pearson Online Learning Services. And we're partners with over 50 universities and now 250 programs. Wow. Um, including schools like ASU Online, um, University of Southern California, and uh, some other, lots of schools. <laughs> That's great. So we have a, a big sample size there to draw on. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, great. So first question. we. We have a lot of experience on the stage here, years of experience, um, and the research just showed that the decision process has been changing in the last five years. How have you observed the decision process of prospects changing in the last few years with all this access to information? Um, Andrew, let's start with you. I would say um, in, in some ways, it, as a marketer, it's becoming a little more difficult to, um, to, to kind of find people and where they are in the decision process. I think, I think you know, students, you know, whether they're young professionals or people that are further along in their career, are more inclined to want to do their own research. Mm -hmm. And you know, as marketers, we want, we want to know about them as soon as possible. You know, we want them to fill out this lead form. We, we, we want to you know, kind of you know, uh, get some information about them so we can start personalizing to them. But I don't think they want that. I think they kind of want to you know, figure things out on their own a, a little bit before they um, before they start engaging with us. Um, and I think you know, one thing that we're doing um, at eCornell is we're starting to, you know, information that we would normally kind of place behind some type of form or something like that, we're just giving it to people because they, they want it. And, and they're going to, if they don't get it from us um, with, you know, in the ways that they want it, they, they might you know, go elsewhere. So just kind of taking down some of those walls and making that information a little more accessible. Yeah, that's a really key strategy, building that relationship first before they, you ask for that information. Mm, yeah. Krista, how about you? Have you noticed any major changes in the last few years? Uh, absolutely. Um, I've almost in eight years now, and it used to be we had to go uh, find people that were in active search. So they would go out searching for degrees, or they would have the intention of how to advance my career and, and have those specific search terms. And now with social, uh, LinkedIn, 
um, we can hit those people before they even know they're looking to advance or uh, you know enhance their their position or change careers by targeting skill sets that they might already have um, or industries that they're they're in um, or even alumni that that have attended already and and allowing them to see the offerings we have to further their education mm -hmm. I'd love to touch on that so in the research we saw that you know, alumni is an untapped opportunity for marketers. Um, Andrew, are you, are you involving your alumni at all in your marketing? How do you, how do you speak to them? We, um, we kind of graciously ask our alumni, um, both alumni of Cornell University and alumni of our programs, to, um, if they have kind words about us, to share them. Um, and, and a lot of them do. And, and we have a lot of really good social proof, um, a, a lot of very happy people who have, um, you know, graduated from our, our programs, and, and you know, their career has has kind of, you know, uh, you know, advanced because of that. Um, so, so we we base, you know, our, our main thing is we, you know, like the research shows, uh, people are very heavily influenced by what their peers are saying, um, what their professional network is saying. So we try to get as much of that social proof out in front of our audience uh, as possible. I mean. You know, it, the, I mean, for me personally, the way that I make buying decisions or, or do research, um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost exclusively interested in the experiences that other people, uh, other people have had. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's really no better. I mean, you know, as a marketer, of course, I'm going to tell you that, you know, our product is really awesome. Yeah. Um, so, but we want other people to say that too. Yeah. How about you, Krista? Yeah, we, I mean, like I just said, we target um, people that have attended or still attend those universities. Um, we could do a better job um, in using them as brand ambassadors, really, um, and having them spread the word. I, I feel like it's moved more into, and you're, I might be stealing your thunder a little bit here, but it's moved more into the personalized social influence. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard of personalized search, so, you know, Google makes it perfectly for you. Well, there's now like personalized social influence. Mm -hmm. um, and you can only capture those people and touch those people through friends of alumni, friends of friends. So they really have to be the ones spreading that word. And I think that really underscores the importance of partnering with your alumni groups as well. You know, I worked in higher ed, I know how siloed it can be. But there's a great opportunity for marketing to partner with alumni and use, use their touch points of communication to get your program information out there. One, if, if you're on, sorry, okay. I, I was okay. going to say one of the, um, one of the big like, you know, areas that, that we find that people kind of are both our alumni and people who are interested in, in our programs, um, they find us on LinkedIn. They find our LinkedIn group. We have a, a, a very active LinkedIn group, and it, it's almost by accident. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was set up, and, and, and people ask questions. And, you know about hey you know is the marketing strategy program any good is the executive leadership program any good and and we don't have to prompt anybody to answer it people are just jumping in and answering i mean that that's I, i'd love to take credit for that but th that's just happening on its own so that that's another another way that that we're finding that that people are are, are doing their research yeah and we're all strapped you know we don't have um, the budgets or the manpower to to manage too many social networks so those brand ambassadors are mm -hmm. really key you yeah. know you can have them you know, speaking from the heart about their, your degree and their experience, and that's even more valuable in a lot of ways. Great, so let's take a step back and just think about your major challenges. So what are the key challenges that you, you're facing as you're trying to hit your goals, and what are your opportunities to, to overcome them? Krista, you start with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the biggest is there's just so much competition out there. Um, that the brand, the school, the college, the program, whoever it is, needs to really find their identity, their voice, their personality, and set, that's what's gonna set them apart um, because it's gonna continually increase. Like I think MBAs, don't, don't quote me, I wanna say there's 500 of them online. Um, you know, and you, there's gonna be sets where you all have the same tuition, you all have even regionally the same um, offerings, you all have the same concentrations, you have great faculty, you have you know, awesome programs, but it's for them in a comparison, if you looked in, in like a little checkoff chart, it, it still looks the same. So yeah. the only thing that's gonna set you apart is showing them who you really are, um, opening up a little bit. I, I, I think we tend to err on the conservative side. 
So just being able to be yourselves as the college that you are and letting them see that, and that's where also brand ambassadors come out because they also help develop and, and kind of set the way for that. Would set you apart. That's going to be your key um, selling point, unique selling point. Yeah. I would say, you know, from a, a, as a digital marketer, probably one of the biggest challenges is um, data. I know some of the folks earlier were talking about, uh, you know, uh, some of the... Um, some of the ways that you can manage your data and understand your students more. Um, it's a, there's, a, there's a lot of information. I mean, we're talking about a, a fairly long uh, research and uh, cycle and, and you know, the, the buying decision. You know, the, these folks who are investing in their education, you know, they're not you know, buying a phone or something. You know, the, it's, it's akin to like buying real estate. You, know, you, don't, you wouldn't just drive through a neighborhood and say, you know, I'll take that one. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it, because the, the process lasts such a long time and because people, I think, are, are more interested in kind of doing a lot of that research on their own, um, it makes kind of wrangling that data that's associated with that pretty difficult. And, we, we've, you know, we've tried a number of, um, you know, solutions in our, you know, marketing stack, and we've tried to um, kind of figure out some ways that we can be a, a little smarter about how we use the data. But, you know, I still find myself in Excel spreadsheets almost every day. Yeah. Which, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world, but um, it, it's, it, it I, I feel like it's, it's kind of like this, this bottleneck, I think, that a lot of people are facing. I, you know, uh, higher education and, and anywhere, really, if you're doing digital marketing. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it's scary to get out of the lower funnel into the, the larger funnel yeah. marketing because it's scary because there, there isn't that quantifiable data. You yeah. know what's happening, you just have no connection to the two. So we end up in that lower zone, but really what this information is telling us that we have to, to branch out and go higher. Yeah, let's dive deeper on that because it is scary. You know, you're, we're all worried about leads. You know, it's so easy to measure leads, um, but really, we really need to look at the quality of those leads and the quality of the students that come in because they're going to be the graduates, they're going to be the, the brand on your school. How do you look further up in the funnel? Like, are you, are you thinking about new strategies to get higher in the uh, top of the funnel, mid funnel? We'll start with you, uh, Andrew. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, our, our strategy around that, it, and, you know, it, it's not, this, this isn't unique or anything, but it, it's really just be, being a lot smarter with the content marketing that we're doing, mm -hmm. um, the types of content that we're putting in front of people. Um, the, the, the messaging that's in it, the tone of it, um, and, and, you know, as, as much as we'd all like to market to um, an individual, you know, every individual separately and, and address their unique needs, we can't. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, segmenting your audience as much as possible and, and getting, you know, meaningful, helpful content in front of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not freaking out when they don't convert to a lead <laughs> in two days or something. Yeah. That you, or that you can track. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, we are very metric driven. Um, we have a very long cycle. I, I mean, it's anywhere from six months to, to over a year. Mm -hmm. So we do have quality metrics in place to kind of mark um, where they are in the decision cycle, uh, you know, how qualified, how interested, and then if they actually could get in. And we, I mean, we have all of that down to a T. But it doesn't help us if we can't track that student coming in. <laughs> so um, it's something that we struggle with, also that we're working on. But inherently, um, you know, we're just you just have to constantly test. So we're putting things out there, um, leaving little breadcrumbs, trying to see. I mean, recently we were doing some some radio tests, and we've noticed you know certain uplifts in brands searches and and things like that. So I mean, you just have to get really creative and just continually test and question, research, survey, mm -hmm. repeat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's talk about content. So we talked about um, you know, developing content that's relevant. What is the secret to developing content that's, that's great, that prospects would, would really want to click on, share? Is there a secret sauce to developing content that really works? Um, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the secret sauce. It's, next question. It's having Andrew on. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. No. Um, no. I, I think um, I'm finding that it, it really comes down to the messaging that you use and and your ability to uh, connect with people um, in in a meaningful way. Uh, and and I think a lot of times that comes down to 
your ability to communicate, your ability to write. I, I think that's, that's an incredibly important skill when it comes to digital marketing because you know, we're talking about reaching people with you know, like sometimes you know, fewer characters than a tweet you know, and you have to try to like, you know, convince them to do a lot of different things in, in, in a very small amount of space. So you have to, be, um, you have to nail it when it comes to copy. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that's kind of one of, the, one of the secrets to it. How about you, Krista? Which, what type of content works best in, in your measurements? I'm going to say authenticity, personality. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot out there that's information, infographics, um, hitting on subject matters that you could probably find on like about.com and whatnot. So I mean, it's really just getting to what you're good at, um, getting your faculty to write it, uh, especially if they're known or make them known in the industry. So that would be the authenticity and, and just showing them what you do and do, do that best. Yeah, that's the amazing thing. Uh, you know, as schools, we, we're sitting on so much content with faculty mm -hmm. and it might not be ready for, for prime time yet, but there are strategies that you can do to, to get them on, on your social network. So um, we'll definitely be talking about that later with Maya Pope Chappelle, but I think that's a key mm -hmm. opportunity for a lot of schools. So let's talk about um, the context context of the networks, you know, we talked about how professional networks are three times more influential than personal social networks, and I think a lot of reason for that is the context. Do you, um, do you change your content um, by the context where it's going to be placed, or do you have different strategies for different types of social networks? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go first. Um, yeah, the, the simple answer is yes, um, and, and you know, a, a, an example of that would be, you know, when we're marketing to people on LinkedIn, um, we're we're delivering much more sophisticated mess messaging. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of speaking a, almost a different language than say, you know, like somebody who we would try to, you know, acquire on Facebook or any other social network. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, uh, you know, f for me, I mean. LinkedIn is kind of, it's kind of our bread and butter. I mean, that, that, it's almost like the network was created for us to, like that's where our audience is. So it's, it's very easy for us to, um, to reach people there. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, we, we've, we've done tests where we run the same content, the same copy, the same ads that we have on LinkedIn. On Facebook, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a knock on Facebook. It, it's just, it's a different network and people are going there for different reasons. People are going to LinkedIn to, to, to develop their professional life, to enhance their career, you know, it's, it's, that's what they're going there for. People go to Facebook for a number of other reasons. Great. Krista, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the, the imagery um, and the messaging is definitely different on, on Facebook versus LinkedIn. LinkedIn, it, they're consuming that information, so a lot of that's driven um, by facts, by um, job title, like where you could go with certain degrees. Um, and, and Facebook, it's just there's so much going on, especially in ads, that you really have to grab attention before you can give them the information. Whereas LinkedIn, like Andrew said, they're actively searching out um, and just constantly, I know I am at least, constantly looking for information to excel like my own skill sets. Mm -hmm. So having content that goes beyond just information, program information, and give them, a, you know, like a little bit of what your curriculum entails. Mm -hmm. um, give them something that like, wow, I'm really interested. That sounds like something I'm, I want to do. Yeah. I think the beauty of uh, the LinkedIn platform is that uh, the content from a school aligns so perfectly with that professional mindset. You know, people are on our platform uh, to be successful to have aspirations and to uh, accomplish those aspirations. So it's a natural fit with schools. And even if you're talking about your application deadline or you know, this new program that you're launching, it's, it's relevant with the other content on our platform. So I think it matches up really well. So let's talk about data. So you mentioned spreadsheets. I think that's another big difference about marketers nowadays. You know, we, we are forced to be very data driven. You know, we, uh, we have a lot of tools that are in our tool set. So what are your best practices and advice about measuring, you know, and crunching these numbers. How do you do it? Let's start with you, Andrew. I would say um, um, I, I've got this idea stuck in my head lately about, about digital marketing where, you know, it's, it's, it's an art and there, there's an art to it and there's a science to it. And I, I think at some point, you know, what, what really separates people who are really good at it from people who are just okay at it is, 
you know, a, you, you can't just look at the data alone. You know, I mean, there's always going to be gaps. There's always going to be holes. Um, and, you know, we can, we can work like heck to try to figure those out. But in the meantime, you have to be smart. You have to kind of, you know, use your experience and, and what you know about your audience to, to, to fill in those data gaps. Um, so I, th I think, you know, in terms of a best practice, um, you know, it, it's not, not, you know, not only is it, is it crucial to understand the data that you have, but it's also important to understand the data that you don't have and, and to accept that, you know, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, usually, you know, if, it, it's, if, it, if there's a problem, it's not like you can just, you know, hit a button and it's going to fix it. You have to just work around it. Um, so, you know, data, data is great, but it's not, it's not everything. Mm -hmm. How about you, Chris? I know that you have... <laughs> best practices on crunching the numbers because that's a, a huge part of your job, right? Yes, we have, I have a 48 page document on best practices oh, wow. <laughs> on crunching numbers. <laughs> but I agree, it's not the end all be all. Um, I wouldn't just take the users only find three colleges and that's it and they don't talk to you beforehand. I mean, it's different for every school, it's different for every program. Um, what works well with one and we're so sure of it, we find out, you know, and we test and we find out it just totally flopped for this other audience. I mean, you, I, I think I mentioned last night, is like every time I think I know something, I realize how much I, I absolutely do not know because they just, the audience always ends up doing opposite of what I think is going to be the right thing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, use it cautiously, but just constantly push the boundaries of testing and, and don't ever rely on it as the end all be all. Yeah, I think that's the other key thing to take away from all this is testing, you know, because everything is so different Absolutely. depending on the program. So you have to find the best practices by program, you know, so this, yeah. it, it really is, is crucial. Great, so um, we started this off going in our DeLorean to go back in time, now let's fire it up again and go forward. Uh, you know, we're getting ready to start 2016 planning already. So thinking about next year, what do you think is the, the future? What are, what are your goals next year as you start to develop your 2016 plans? What's your wish list? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of makes me feel like I should have a 2016 plan right now. Um, so uh, pressure. Now we do. We totally do. Um, it's somewhere. Uh, I, I would say, um, you know, with, with with this movement towards personalization in, in marketing, um, it's it's a great idea, and and in theory, it sounds really great. Um, but for all the reasons that we discussed, it, it, it's it's quite difficult to do. Um, you know, I, I think we're we're seeing a lot of technology thrown at marketing these days. You know, marketing automation, and and you know, there's there's that that space is you know, there's even you know, uh, technology that's being stacked on top of marketing automation. It's just kind of, but I, I, it feels like that we need some type of breakthrough. And when I say we, I mean people way smarter than I am who can do this stuff. Um, but uh, that we need j just a better way to. Um, again, back to the data to, to, to manage the data around you know doing this personalized marketing, mm -hmm. um, because again, putting myself in the shoes of someone who, who is marketed to, um, you know, a, a personalized message is the, one of the most powerful things that you can get. Mm -hmm. How about you, Krista? I have a really long wish list. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, attribution modeling would be on the top, the tip top of mine, so that we could actually visualize some of the data that we're missing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'll put you guys on the spot, but, <laughs> but lookalike modeling within LinkedIn would be amazing. <laughs> I think that would open up, like you were saying, uh, be a way for us to find new audiences, because we already kind of understand who they are, but we're manually entering what we think makes up a potential student. And you guys have so much data on the back end that might not be visible to us that I, I feel like there would be a, a really great <laughs> model there that... I get the hint, I'll take yeah. the notes. Yeah, yeah. Right, we'll definitely, <laughs> no, we are working on that. And we, you know, no, I know you. No, no spoiler <laughs> alerts, but yeah, that's, I think that's definitely on top of our list too. Well, that's great. I think um, that's what, all we have time for. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming up here and sharing your experience. Sure. Um, we are just about to break for lunch, so thank you all for, for being so attentive, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you at lunch. Thank you. Thanks.